And welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Expedition Church of the Triad. We're so glad to have you with us tonight and invite you to uh, join us in our Sunday services and Wednesday services, 10 and 30 on Sunday morning and 6, 7 p.m. on Sunday night. Of course, tonight we're at 6 because we had our uh, Wednesday night dinner uh, here at the church. And uh, in the verbiage of Eastern Carolina people, we had chicken and pastry. Green beans and yams, hallelujah. And uh, it was some kind of good, hallelujah. I would say it would slap your mama good, but that would be unbiblical. So um, it would still slap your mama good, hallelujah. And glory to God. Can I get a witness? Amen. Hallelujah. Did anybody not go back for seconds? Oh, you got seconds I'll start with. Okay, okay. That's what I did. Janice handed me a child's plate. Like, what is this? Hallelujah. Well, we're glad to have you with us tonight. We are ministering or teaching on being redeemed from spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. <coughs> spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. Opening your foundation text. Just from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. We talked about that the threefold curse of the fall in the Garden of Eden was spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. And uh, we covered last time we were together on uh, the consequences of spiritual death and the recovery from it. Hallelujah. And we covered the types of death. And, um, you know, again, always remember, death in the Bible does not mean cessation of existence, okay? It is separation. Spiritual death is separation of the human spirit from God, the Father of life, or the God of life, or God is life. Hallelujah. Physical death is a separation of the human spirit from the physical body. And eternal, or the second death, is the eternal separation of man's spirit from the presence of God, okay? Does not mean to cease to exist, all right? We think of that because we're so carnal-minded. We see somebody physically die. We don't see them anymore. They're buried, you know, cremated, whatever. You can't see them again. And so they, in one sense, we think they cease to exist. Although we get, you know, we kind of go, well, the Bible says, you know, they're with the Lord, that, you know. But, you know, there's a, there's a side of it that says they're not here. Okay? So we adopt in, a, in, in an underlying thinking that it means it ceases to exist, and it doesn't. It's just separation, okay? All right. The second part of the curse was poverty. You'll, you'll live by the sweat of your brow, God told Adam and Eve, okay? And man, you know, uh, <coughs> I've said this before. How many of you ever planted a garden? What happens if you don't stay after that garden all the time? You'll have the best-looking weeds of anybody on the block. I mean, they'll grow six foot tall. You know, your your little greedy collar plants down here struggling, and they got weeds this tall, flowering up. I mean, they healthy babies. You pull them up, they got a root system all out here. Take up all the nutrients. Okay, that's a curse. Okay, you got to go out there and you got to pick the uh, pull them weeds up. You know, and then torch them. Get a blowtorch and kill them. You know, kill the roots because they'll come back. I mean, they'll get, up, they'll get up from the dead, rise from the dead. All right. So poverty is part of the curse. And we see in Deuteronomy 28. Go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy 28. And then we're not, we're not going to start in verse 1. We're going to jump down to verse 15 because we're talking about the curse part. Okay. So Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. All right, all the blessings of Abraham. That's a Lynn Mink song. I found my cassette tape the other day. <laughs> I'm still glad I got a cassette player I can play it on. <laughs> Some of y'all done got rid of all that stuff. Now, 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 let's just go, let me tell you, don't get rid of your cassette players. Don't get rid of your CD players. Because what you're going to find out when you got rid of your turntables, now vinyl's back in style. So then you got to go buy a vinyl, a, 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 a turntable, so you can play your vinyl. You know, there's nothing like the warmth of the pop, 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 pop. 
you know, from the lint on the, on the needle, okay, or the scratch. <laughs> Hallelujah. And um, I, we, got a, we have a CD player um, in, our, in our family room that we haven't used in so long because we've been using MP3 to the system. And Jane said, I want to hear a CD. I don't want to hear that other man. Oh, okay, honey, I got a CD. Went to open it up and found a CD I've been missing for three years. So I, well, I know I, I know I hadn't used this in three years. It was Ray Jean uh, Wilson's uh, uh, Say Amen CD. I tore the house upside down looking for that more than once. Called him and tried to get another copy, you know, and, you know, got the case. Had no idea what a CD was. Popped it open and said, oh, there's a CD in it. Say amen. I found it. <laughs> it was a glorious moment. Hallelujah. But Deuteronomy chapter 28, um, after the first 14 verses, okay, and, and you know, that's um, the blessing. But God says to them this, but it shall come to pass if. Now, how many love that it shall come to pass stuff? Until you get to verse 15, you don't want it. Okay? All right? If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, listen, to observe, to do all his commandments and statutes for that which I command thee this day, then all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Listen to this. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Jump down to verse 38. Thou shalt carry out much seed into the field, and thou shalt gather but little in, and the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. They shall have olive trees throughout the coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thy olive tree shall cast its fruit. That don't sound like a blessing, does it? It's a curse. It's the curse of poverty. It's the curse of poverty. And so... Um, and we all know that I, I, I plant stuff and you look out there and there's some, something been eating holes in it. The leaves got, you know, eat slam up. You know, well, what? And you got to seven dust it. Okay. Well, then once you seven dust, you can't eat it for two weeks. You got to leave it and let it sit for two weeks before you can harvest it. Okay. Not sure what's in seven dust, but you don't want to ingest it after, after only uh, four days of it being on the leaf. Hallelujah. And I'm not sure what about what's so special about the 14 days, but you got to wait 14 days. And um, praise the Lord for victory over the curse of poverty. Amen. Hallelujah. And so poverty is a curse, and it is not what God intends for the believer. Okay? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, or he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty uh, you might be rich. What He took poverty. Now, let, let, let's kind of correct something here. The excessive prosperity teaching is everybody's going to be millionaires. We're all going to have multi-millions of dollars in the bank and not have to work and the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. And so all of it's coming to us. Bill Gates' money's mine in Jesus' name. Because it's laid up for the just. Okay? And we take it to an excess, and we end up driving people away from, you know, biblical prosperity, having your need met, having supply over to give and to sow and to work, do the work of God. It does not necessarily mean million dollars. Now, I may as well just jump on it with both feet, stomp it in the ground, dig a hole, and bury it. Because I'm not, you know, when prosperity preachers preach prosperity and it becomes them that are getting the wealth and the people not getting it, something's wrong with the way that they're delivering the message. Hello. Hello. Somebody made this statement about 15 years ago. Give up to the higher anointing. You have to give to the higher anointing. Okay? Really? Who did Abraham pay tithe to? 
Melchizedek, we didn't even know who he was. He didn't have a genealogy. We'll read this in a minute. He didn't have a genealogy. Okay. And who was the higher anointing? Of course, the preachers. So we started the whole thing of walking up to the platforms during church, stuffing money into their pockets, filling up their clothes, their coat pockets, throwing it on the floor around them. Okay. I, I, I got disgusted. I just, I, I mean, I can't say anything else about it. Um, the man's ministry is good. He has a lot of great things to say. It's blessed me in the past. But at this moment, I was disgusted. Because one day, they, you know, they were coming up. They're putting, trying to put money, money in their pockets. And it was falling through the coat. Next day, they wore a leisure suit with an elastic zip. The last time I had the coat zipped up so it didn't fall through and fall to the floor. I was just disgusted. You know? It, and everybody that preached... Had everybody in the building getting up, walking up, putting money, because they were preaching this prosperity that giving up, you know, giving to the minister, giving to the higher anointing, and that kind of stuff. Now, look, the Bible does teach you should not muzzle the oxen that tradeth out the corn. But it didn't say go bankrupt, making sure they're living, you know, that they're a, uh, a, a, in the queue for the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Hello. Paul said, I'd rather spend than be spent for the gospel's sake. Hello. So we, listen, we can't, we, you can't go from one ditch to the other ditch. You can't go over here where, Lord, you keep them poor, we'll keep them humble. No, you keep them humble, we'll keep them poor. Talk about ministers, you know. They, you, know can't, well, you keep them humble, we're going to keep them poor. The board, you know, we ain't going to give them nothing. That's too much money. You can't have that. Okay, that, that's the extreme over here. They're worthy of double honor, especially labor and word and deed. So there's a, there are scriptures that talk about that ministers should be well taken care of. But what's well taken care of? What's the relationship of that? Is it that the whole church, now, now some people preach that, you know, that if, you know, you give everything to the preacher and he gets to drive around in a Rolls Royce, you know, and, and, and you're um, getting off your moped, you're going to get off your moped and get a real car, you know. You gotta be careful. Got, there has, just has to be a balance in here, okay? There's a curse of poverty out there. The Bible does say to give, and it shall where? Well, we're supposed to sow into the to the church, to the kingdom of God. Bring the tithe and offering into the storehouse, and prove that there may be meat in my house. What what's the meat for? To take care of 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 doing the ministry. Amen. I said amen. Now. I mean, I, I, I think I have a hard time thinking about, you know, these churches that, you know, they have the Aunt pastor's uh, appreciation day and buy them a $64,000, $70,000 car. I mean, you know, and people give into that, don't even have a car. Well, I'm sowing seed from a car. You got to sow your seed in the right kind of ground. Amen. Amen. We should, I mean, ministry should be taken care of. But, I mean, let's, let's, not, let's stop with some of the lasciviousness and, and the uh, over whatever and under the guise that I'm going to get rich and get debt cancellation and all this stuff by giving to the preacher. Okay. God's people ought to have the best. See, we use these things that there's an element of truth in it. But we manipulate the people. See, when you got the podium and you're, you're saying, you know, um, I, I'm good ground. I've heard people say, I'm good ground. Not the ministry I am. You know? And, you know, you're going to get a thousand fold. One guy was preaching one day. Uh, the thousand fold donning just came on me. That ain't even in the Bible. 30, 60, and 100 are in the Bible. And really, it's not even talking about money. Okay? And so we get into these excesses that in the end, I, I, I'm so tired of seeing charlatans run off living in these extreme lifestyles while the people who supported it ain't nowhere. Amen. Now, 
if you're wondering why we, you know, um, I, I stopped pastor appreciation for me a few years ago because we had people fighting in the church over how the money was being spent to give me a gift. About to have a knockdown, drag out fight in the church over blessing the pastor. I don't need that kind of blessing. That's cursed seed. Hello? Hello? So I, I mean, I went and told him, just stop doing that. Don't do that. You know? There's nothing wrong. I, 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 you know, Pastor Appreciation Month, week, whatever. Uh, that's all great. But at that time, I didn't want to ever see it again. I, at that time, I never wanted to see it again. I got, got church folks fighting. Well, that's not healthy for the church. Oh, but Pastor Ed got, you know, got this or got that. Yeah, it, you know, it's hard to enjoy when people have been, had, it caused problems. We don't want that. Amen. All right. So we, we don't want that kind of thing going on. I mean, if somebody wants to do something, let them do it. But let's not have a fight over it. How's that money being spent? You want me to give to that? How are you spending it? Are you taking something for yourself? Oh, my God. Keep your blessing. All right? I mean, please keep it. I don't want it. Um, so poverty is a curse. But if we're going to get out of poverty, let's first of all follow biblical principles first. Now, and I've kind of semi, more than semi, address ministers. Remember that whatever we're doing should be for the work of the ministry. Yes, God, I have no problem with being blessed. I have no problem with God blessing a minister. But he also, the people ought to be getting blessed too. If it's just the minister, something's wrong with the paradigm. How many have ever been involved with, heard of, or been asked to join a multi-level marketing scheme? Okay. And what's the selling point? Oh, they show you the double diamonds and their yachts and their houses. Hello. And, you know, and, um, you know, you can, you can have all of this by getting in the downline. And what does everybody do when they get in? They've been sold on the concept. They're going to reach double diamond and have all this stuff. But what are they doing? They all, you only have to sell $100 a month worth of the product. See, they're not selling the product. They're selling you in there, sending money up to the guy above you. So what happens? You're not going out and getting people to buy that product. You're buying it yourself. And they would tell you that in the meeting. You'll buy this much stuff yourself. Hello? And it became a cult. Guy came, ABC did a special on one of them. Guy came home. And he said this. He said, he's like preaching. He's like preaching a message. If I went home today. And my wife told me it was her or Amway. I'd say Amway because I know how Amway changed my life. Here I went and said it. But this, this was a tape. It was public. So I'm just repeating. Okay. It was on the newscast. I know what it did for me. I know how it changed my life. He would let, let his wife leave before he gave up a business product. Something's wrong with that. He talked about it like it was Jesus Christ himself and was preaching like it. Okay? Well, if ministers, we had this thing up oh, 20 years ago. It's called some type of telephone card, and they called me. You know, and I always, we always hear this statement there when they, when they go out to Christians. Well, you know, the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. So, you know. So they had their pyramids, the pyramids, the pyramid scheme, that's all it is. 
So I asked the guy who was coming out to me and trying to get me to get into it. I said, what's the break-even point? When do you cross over from, you know, losing money to making money? What's the percentage? Out of 100 people. The top 11% make money. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, the, self, the wealth of the sinners laid it for the just. So what you're telling me in my downline, 89 people have to be sinners. They didn't know what to say. Sound like a motorboat. <laughs> had no clue what to say. So the top 11 are born again believers. The other 89 are sinners. And for number 12 to move up, he's got to get saved. And the number, the top guy moving to his, another new pyramid and start a new line and the other, and then to move somebody else in at number 100 because the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. They didn't know what to do with it. Guys, it, the guys that started to end up getting charged by the government and went to jail for an illegal pyramid scheme. But they were running in churches like crazy. Churches were buying into it, making uh, uh, the, top, uh, uh, the pastors and stuff were making all kinds of money. And I wouldn't do it. I refused to do it. Now, do you know? Now, can you do you know why I will not do a pyramid scheme? Do you know why I'm not a salesman of anything? And if I were, I would never approach anybody in the church. Do you know why? Because when I come to you, when I'm in your life, when you see me, the only hat I wear is pastor. I'm not your, I'm not your upline. I'm not, I'm not your, you know, I can't, I don't go, like take the pastor hat off, put on upline hat. Now let's talk about your, you know, how, how much you're selling. That's not my, that's not my calling. My calling is to pastor you. It is not to try to sell you insurance, uh, you know, multi-level marketing, anything to subsidize the ministry. You want to subsidize the ministry? Just give an offer to the church for me. I'm serious. You know, take, take all your money you're going to buy a buying product and put it in there and say Pat for pastor, if that's what you want to do. But let's call it what it is and don't try to make something that's not. All that aside, okay. one that's clear the air so we can go forward. Because inevitably, people have people been here, gone through that, and then when you start talking along the lines of prosperity or whatever, they, they can think about the times they've been burned. Okay? There was a guy in town when, a number of years ago. We first came here. Had a couple of guys in the church. Really on fire for the Lord, zealous. They went to the meeting. They said, Pastor, you don't really come here. So I, I, I can't make it. You know what? I don't run to a meeting because somebody invited me. I'm serious. Well, they, they, they love God. You know, they're on fire for God. You know, da, 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 da. I don't go. Unless I feel good in here about it. It could be Brother Jerry. And if I don't have clear, I'll just say, Brother, I can't make it. And he, if you press me on it, why not? Well, just to be honest with you, I don't have, a, I got a check from the Holy Ghost. So don't press me. If you don't want to hear it, don't ask. <laughs> okay. Okay, you know, I don't go to a lot of places just because everybody's excited about it. And they, oh, this is the best thing since peanut butter and sliced bread. God's a moving over there. I've, I've had people tell me that stuff. And, yo, you've got, you've got to be here for that meeting. This is awesome. And something's going, <laughs> fingernails on the chalkboard. And I can't tell you why. I can't articulate in any words as the reason why. I just know that I got fingernails on the chalkboard going off in here. Then come to find out they're homosexual. And everybody thought they were the greatest thing in the world. 
just <laughs> slobbering all over the place of how great they were. Hello? Are you here? No. See, you, you've got to follow your spirit. And it may, it, it's going to be no, so many times, it ain't going to make sense why there's just an uncomfortability about it. You can't explain it. Don't you override that. You better listen to that. Because it could draw you into something you don't need to be in. Hello? I know I'm on prosperity, but I'll get back to that story. I'm, this is the rabbit trail. And I'm a beagle right now. <laughs> that, that works real good in our family. And Dennis and Shannon had two of them now. I mean, purebred, wide open beagle. Amen. You know, um, just because half the church is doing it, don't make it. And we're just going to, this, we're kind of on prosperity, poverty, but let's just take this trail where we are. A number of years ago, um, there was this woman, and I, if I told you the name of the big ministries that brought her up on their platforms, you'd fall out of your seat. People you like, people you bought their books and tapes, and it's still been a blessing to you even since then. And she was going around. And um, she would have oil appear on the palms of her hands. And feathers would fall. And blood would come out of her palms. And they would bring them up. And, and somebody told somebody, said, don't do that. Something's wrong with this. And they did it anyway. One of them had a down, huge, broad television show and put her on the television. What happened with that? Instant credibility with everybody. So finally... A minister who had a children's program that they brought, they made videos and stuff for, and I won't tell you his name, but you can probably figure it out. Okay. Bill Gunner <laughs> okay. took video cameras into one of the meetings somewhere, and they were high, they were, they were ultra high end, slow speed cameras, and recorded it. And took it back into their studio and went through it frame by frame. It was all stuff she had up her sleeves, literally. And, and they, they, they got that out there and completely discredited her. But think about all the people who were affected by the big ministries having her because of this sign that nobody was, was saying, stop, don't do this. Or maybe one or two people, something's not right about it. I noticed that Dad Hagen didn't have anything to do with it. Not a thing. Okay? All right? So, you know, we just have to be careful about those things. You know, so I went to her from, where did I leave on that rabbit trail from? You've got to listen to the Spirit of God. So here, yeah, now my point was this, just because they're a <coughs> well-known big ministry and they condone it, doesn't mean it's right. Are you here? Now there's another big ministry, the one that would turn out to be a homosexual. That guy, there was a very well-known minister who knew a lot about devils and everything. And he was supporting the ministry. And people were telling him, no, you got to understand, he's doing this, and he's doing that, and he's doing this. And he didn't hear it. And then it was too late after he got exposed. You know, his, his credibility took, took a hit for a season. Now, so I just don't run off to anybody's meeting. I don't care if they're an associate staff member at Expedition Church. If something ain't right about it, don't do it. Hello. Okay. Um, so this guy was in town, Greensboro. We've only been here 
um, less than a year. And that guy had come here the year before. Pastor, you got to go. You got to go hear this guy. And I'm thinking, I ain't going. Didn't that, they didn't, didn't ask me why I wasn't going. I just didn't go. And they came in that Sunday. And they looked look like two whip puppies. I mean, like, I mean, like pig pen walking into church with his cloud of dust. I said, did y'all go to the meeting? Yeah. What happened? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. They went the year before. And when the guy got ready to take up the offering, he has, has traveling, you know, compadre with him. And they started doing things about taking up the offering and, you know, ways that make get a lot of money, manipulative ways. And he turned around to the guy and went, I've never done this before anywhere, have I? No, never done it before in your life. Never done it before in your life. Comes back to the same town the next year and does the exact same thing. And you don't know the effect it had on them. They were just crushed. Because the year before, they thought it was the greatest thing since Peter butter and sliced bread and just found out it was a gig. Come back the next year and do it exactly the same. What are they counting on? They're counting on having so many people there who weren't there the year before that it don't matter if somebody was there because it's not going to get out and they would take the money and run. They packed up, left town, and... The people who didn't know about the previous year are like, "Woo, that was awesome. And the people who did are like, that was fake. Turn to the guy and say, I've never done it like this anywhere, have I? No, you've never done it. Lying. Like a hound dog on a front porch on a hot summer afternoon. That's lying. Okay. Nathan's dog, he'll get out there in the sun, and he won't even bother. I mean, a squirrel can run across there, and he's like, I ain't bothering. I'm nice and warm, you know. I ain't, ain't going to mess with it. <clears throat> All right. So you got to follow your spirit. You all hear? Oh, but God's doing this and God's doing that. Yeah, but that's so and so. Oh, but you, I mean, you better check down in here. Now, my own personal experience is this. <laughs> we won't go here, we're going to finish up here, all right? We'll just pick up next week and do the prosperity poverty thing. <laughs> we're over here, I ain't, ain't going to try to bring it back because we're too far gone. It's just the way it is. But y'all learn as much from this as you do anything we do. So when I first got saved, I was in a Pentecostal holiness church. Now, we had a wonderful pastor. Um, he was not a preacher. Now, if you're old Pentecostal, your pastor's got to be a preacher. And if you don't, they're going to vote you out. That's just the way it was. And if, you, if they didn't vote him out, the, the anti didn't like the way he ministered people, started trying to work deals over the next few years while he was in his, you know, four-year cycle to get rid of them. I chewed one of my cousins out. Who do you think you are? You don't like the way he ministers? Go find another church. I won't even go in there anymore. Because God had moved, I'd gone to Ramah. Ramah was not really accepted in my, our district. At that time, that's changed. Some of that's changed, but back then it wasn't. Okay, I mean, it went out a memo: don't let anybody preach Copeland or Hagen in your churches. Wow. We had a pastor who'd been a missionary for thirty-four years in in, in, in Central America. He came, went, came back, went to Raymond, came back. They wouldn't give him a church. Well respected, but our conference wouldn't let him have a church, so he had to start one of his own this, and, and leave. Had to turn his papers and leave. Okay. Anyway, our pastor was a teacher. He tried to preach. It just didn't work. Because the people wanted that. Well, bring in an evangelist. That's easy. 
You know, we had we had Action Jackson. I mean, he he preached he preached the roof off the building. Well, bring him in. And they did. Yeah, right here, right time. Then they expect the pastor to be him. Okay. Well, anyway, we had a group in there. And as soon as I got, as soon as I got saved and got in there and Janie got saved, they were inviting us to the cottage prayer meeting. Oh, yeah. Cottage. It's a double wide. It was not a cottage. Look at Pride and Prejudice. You'll find and Sense of Sensibility. You'll see what a cottage is. Okay? A double-wide mobile home is not a cottage. But they had a cottage prayer meeting. Sounded so spiritual. The only thing is, I went for a long time, and the thing that bugged me the most, they never prayed. What do they do? Prophesy. And we had a prayer chair. You don't know how to get prayed for until you've been prayed for in a prayer chair. It's more anointing than the other chairs. Had to be in the prayer chair. Where was it? It's in the middle of the prophesying circle. We all take turns to get in the prayer chair. But it wasn't really a prayer chair. It was a prophesy chair. Because they didn't pray over you. They prophesied. Everybody would prophesy over everybody. And when you got all, all, when everybody finished prophesying over you, you got up, somebody else hopped in there, and we all turned around and prophesied over them. And pretty much the same thing. Yea, thus saith the Lord, yea, my child, yea, this, and yea, that, and a couple other things, and we're done. See, that wasn't the Holy Ghost. But these people in the church, they're in the church and think they're more spiritual than the pastor. They're deeper than the pastor. Got a deeper flow than the pastor. But they weren't called to pastor their people. They weren't called to lead those sheep. They weren't called to stand in that place. They were circumvented authority because they knew they knew the Holy Ghost better than he did. They never actually said it in those verbiage, but everything they did said it. And um, now my Cherokee wife, all white men speak with fork and tongue. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Cherokee rises up and they all speak with fork and tongue. She don't trust nobody. That ain't changed. <laughs> She'll say something to me and go, just saying. I hope y'all can figure out what that means. They need you saying another word. I'm right. Be quiet. I love her. But that's the way it goes. All right. And so we went, and I remember we've been going about three months. Every, couldn't wait to get there on Thursday night to the cottage prayer meeting to get my word of the week. Because <laughs> the Holy Ghost was flowing in that place. And that night, that night, I did not get a word. Jesus left me. He doesn't love me anymore. I didn't get a word. And we're driving home. This, you know, young couple dating. I'm driving her back to her house. Okay. My Fiat 124 Sports Spider Convertible. Okay. Five speed. British racing green with tan interior. Tan top spoke wheels. Trunk mount luggage rack. If the Lord ever speaks to you about buying one for pastor, refurb 1975, I'll take it. <laughs> Not because I'm manipulated, just because you like me, you want to give it for me. <laughs> okay, if you're out there, you just think that's a great thing to do for me, that's great. But I'm not going to say the Lord's going to speak to you and tell you to do it. That's another story. And I'm like devastated. 
I'm devastated for a week. I am. I didn't get a word. How am I going to make it in life? The prayer chair had abandoned me. The word of the Lord was, uh, what was it? How does it say it in the Bible? Was precious in those days, or uh, you didn't ever hear it? Rare. I had a rare moment, and during that time. By the time the next one came around, I told Janie, I said, I'm not going back. She said, why? And I couldn't explain why at the time. Something on the inside, God was able to speak to me during that time and say, basically telling unction me to stay away. Well, it didn't take her long. Yeah. Well, I didn't go there in the first place. <laughs> then people are crazy. They're flaky. Something's wrong with all that. Why didn't you say something? You wouldn't listen. Just saying. <laughs> so I, you know, I stopped going. They ended up, that whole little crowd left the church and she went and started the church. I said, she. The ringleader was a she. You know, and they, they were hooked up with a group of people who probably would line everybody in a bill, one five hundred thousand whatever in the building, line them up and prophesy over every one of them. I believe in prophecy. I believe it's the gift of the Spirit and manifestation in the church today. But I do not believe that the Bible supports he, taking one scripture isolated out of context, you may all prophesy one by one. And using that to prophesy over everybody in the building, every service, every time you get together. That's not what that scripture means. Okay? I believe in prophecy. But more of prophecy in the New Testament is foretelling, inspirational, and not foretelling direction. For they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And I will tell you this today, and I will stand by it no matter what. If a word from the Lord that somebody gives you, me, anybody else that you respect highly, does not bear witness with your heart, you better not act on it. Well, what if it doesn't? Put it on the back burner and leave it alone. You let it simmer. <coughs> hello. I said, hello. You better leave it alone. One reason is because if it doesn't bear witness with your heart, there's not going to be any faith to mix with it. And you can't, and whatsoever is not a faith is sin. You don't need to act on anything you're not in faith about. Hello? What happens if it turns out to be true? Well, later, as you grow in God, I've had God take things that spoke to me. I left alone, just didn't mess with it. And pick it up and bring it back to me. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so and so said that 20 years ago. But now, he's, he's inspired it, brought it to your heart. So, yeah, that can happen, but you got too many people basing their life on a word somebody gave them, making decisions on that. Hello. And listen, folks, we can come up with all kinds of stuff. I notice one thing when people get to prophesying like that, everything is the most lovely thing in the world. I've been in meetings where it won't. Dad Hagen prophesying, you won't listen to your wife. You've been hard-headed. Oh, isn't that great when it's on the video for everybody to see? Amen. I've told this story before. <clears throat> my my hand laying on service with Rama. It was like it was like one of the first ones they had done since, since they had created Rama Ministerial Association, and so everybody came back. and We had this big hand laying on service by Dad Hagen. There was about a thousand of us going to have hand laid on us for the ministry. Now we'd already been at our papers and all that. But it was the first time all of us could get, get back to Tulsa and have a special service for that. And we're about 120, 120 couples down the line. Thank God. 
I'm glad I didn't get there early and get to be first in line. Hello? Because he goes up to the first couple, says, I'll hands on your name, Lord Jesus Christ, separate you. You've been hard-headed. You won't listen to your wife. Well, they're smart. They just go out and go out in the spirit. <laughs> that, that ended that. <laughs> and another couple of times thinking, yeah, glory to God. Glad that ain't me. And I lay hands on you in the name of the Lord Jesus. You've been, you've been hard-headed. You won't listen to your wife. They follow the lead of the other couple. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> About the first eight couples, this happens. Well, you know, if you ever watch dad minister, he'll get going along and all of a sudden he'll step over the tongues and won't speak any more English. So he got around, you know, nine or 10, whatever there, and kind of went in the name and he started speaking in tongues, laying hands on people. And I went, glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Don't worry. The five foot two Holy Ghost made sure I got the message. You need to listen to your wife, me. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> we, we were at, a, we were at a, a Rhema banquet for alumni. I can't remember if it was, I think it was alumni week or something. You know, at the end of the week, we went down to the assembly center and had a big banquet. Uh, all, I mean, just, it was just a huge crowd of, of Rhema uh, graduates and stuff. And Brother Hagin gets up, starts talking, welcome us all there, and, you know, good to have y'all here. You know, and, and everybody's, you know, they always pull on him to be the prophet. Yeah. See, that, see, you can pull on a gift to manifest. And he, he, he just suddenly stops and goes, Air, another year shall come and go. And there will be those who are with us tonight who will, not, who will be absent. Not that they'll be absent from this meeting. They'll be absent from the earth. And then he began to say, why? Two of you are in adultery with your secretary. And somebody else is doing something sinful, sexually sinful. He said, lest ye repent, it'll cost you your life. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> kind of take the wind out of your sails in a meeting. Uh, well, we're going to stop pulling that profit thing right now. That's enough of that. <laughs> so we come back the next year. And he stands up to greet everybody. <laughs> he said, now, last year, the word of the Lord came, and I said this. He said, uh, two of them repented, and they lived. The third one died. And yet again, I say unto you, another year shall come and go. <laughs> oh, we love that prophecy stuff, don't we? We love it when it's, you're going to have the ministry that, you know, that the world has dreamed of. No one will be like thee. I mean, you'll open the door and the lights will flood in from the glory of God on your ministry. <clears throat> we don't like that air another year shall come and go. Hello? Y'all hear you go home. You see, we can't govern the Holy Ghost to do what we like. Now, nobody wants a corrective word. We, um, the year before I got to Ramah, they had a student. He was sitting, not where Dennis is, but well, the, the, the very end aisle seat at the back of the auditorium, Rooker Memorial. Back then, it was Ramah Bible Church building. And uh, <clears throat> when they built the new building, it became Rooker Memorial Auditorium and uh, Sister Hagen's dad. Okay. But we, the, the whole school would be there for um, Holy Ghost seminar, prayer seminar, big meetings. We would do it in there. Camp meeting was done downtown at the assembly center because it couldn't house them. Okay. We'd have 18 to 20,000 come to camp meeting back then. And, um, and so he's sitting there uh, teaching, teaching, um, uh, it was actually a morning faith, seminar, faith foundations class. 
love the prophet's ministry. And he points back at that man. He said, I see death hanging over you. He says, now, you come see me five, six times. And I'll, I'll give you the steps to avoid that. But it's hanging over you like a cloud. And so after the class is over, hey, you come see me now. He didn't run back there and grab it. He said, come see me. Students turned and said, what are you going to do? He said, I ain't going to do a thing. And he died. This is public. Everybody heard him tell him that. I ain't going to do a thing about it. You know? Now, I, I see the, you know, the largest world changers ministry in the history of, of the gospel. Come see me. He probably been up there on the platform before the service was over. <laughs> it's not always going to be hunkadory. And if everything you're ever around is hunkadory, something's not right. It's not kosher. It's out of balance. The Lord chasteneth those he loves. And if you chasten thee not, then you are bastards indeed, is what the scripture says. Illegitimate children. He cuts in church. No, I'm not. It means illegitimate children. Hello? Y'all hear you going home? Now, I'm way over here. I am way over here. Y'all got a rope? <laughs> Y'all pull me back in? And we got off on. Of, we have to follow the Spirit of God in everything. Amen? And so I, ne I never went back to that college prayer meeting. I stayed faithful to the church until I went to Raymond, came back, and they wouldn't let me, they would not, they wouldn't be, want me doing anything in my denomination because I had gone to Raymond. pastor did, but, you know, I know what the denomination stood, and there's only so much he's going to be able to do with the denomination saying this. Okay, so, so we, we moved to, into a different place. Still have tremendous respect for him. And I have, I have respect for my, my uh, denomination I came out of. They love God. They're good people. You know, I, I got my Pentecostal roots from them. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be eternally thankful for that. All right? But there wasn't a place for me at that time with them because of where they stood on some things. Dad Hagen was assembly of God and had to leave because the Lord told him to go, go to all the churches and they wouldn't let him preach in any church but assemblies of God at that time. They changed since then. You know, his superintendent told him, I understand. You, know, you got to obey God. I don't agree with it either, but that's, you know, that's the way it is. They changed over time. Okay. So we can't, you can't hold them to what they did 60 years ago. They changed. They opened up. Okay. You know, but at that time, the, the choice was obey God or stay under this, and you can't stay under that. Okay? <coughs> so he continued to pastor that church until finally the, the he don't preach like so-and-so came got enough. And he didn't get a certain number of votes. He said I, I, he, he just stepped down. He, they didn't vote him out. He stepped down because there was enough that weren't for him. You know? That he, he, he decided instead of having a disruption, he would step down. Ended up coming back as, a, as, a, um, as like a visiting pastor who would, who would go visit people and work, retire. He retired and eventually retired from the denomination and came back to that church and worked as, an, a, as a um, supportive pastor. Okay. Good man, you know. And, um, but that, that cottage prayer me, it was messing me up. It was taking, it was pulling, it was pulling me away from my church, took respect from my, it was trying to take respect from the pastor away from me yes. because they had it. We're in the flow. That's wrong. I said, that's wrong. If it's undermining where you're planted, and you know you're supposed to be there, and you know that the pastor's a man of God, and he, he's supposed to be over your life, and it, it's, it's supplanting that because they know more. Maybe not with words, but with actions. 
I'll tell you something else while I'm on it. I'm not done yet. You see, you can't pastor a church like a Holy Ghost meeting. Brother Hagin do a Holy Ghost meeting, everybody run back to churches and try to have all their services just like the ones he's doing out there traveling. You can't do that. Now, you can have Holy Ghost meetings, but you can't pastor your church and run your church like that all the time. Well, we've got to have the move of the Spirit. You can have the move of the Spirit right now while I'm teaching like I'm teaching. Now, we ain't passed out or uh, slinging the Spirit, stacked up all over the place, jumping all over the pew, uh, chairs and, you know, I mean, got the Holy Ghost. Woo's! I love them. I love to get the, I love getting in and all that. Yeah. But you can't do that every time you come together for church. The Bible tells the pastors, Paul wrote and told that the, the pastors have to be apt to teach. Oh, well, I mean, we got to have that move. You can't have that move all the time and teach. You got to teach. Y'all hear you gone home. Oh, ain't nothing like the mood of spirit we have at our cottage prayer meeting. Really? You're getting the mood of the spirit right now. You're getting information from 42 years worth of ministry in this one service. If that ain't the Holy Ghost, I don't know what is. Amen? I've been in the ministry 42 years. Seen a lot. Been around a lot. Been under very anointed women and men of God. Seen flaky. Been flaky. <laughs> Not just seen it, been there. Done it. Even bought, t made my own t-shirts. <laughs> I used to say, I mean, I was at one point, I thought, I am God's man of faith and power. Had to scratch that on the t-shirt and put it on there, the man of paste and powder. I, I was flopping. You heard about my meeting? I had a meeting down in Chocolate Wendy Community Center. And after a, a, a three-night meeting, had, bill, had bills put up on the telephone poles, come to the Chocowinity Community Center, here the anointed man of God. Had my picture up there, my title. I was, I was, I was cooking with gas, baby. <laughs> had a meeting. We cleared $80 after expenses. <laughs> oh, we're not done yet. Man, that was a roaring success. Going back next month and holding another one. Lost $80. <laughs> we broke even and quit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wasn't I wasn't called. It wasn't the right time and the right place for me to try to do that. I needed to grow up. I had a lot of growing up to do. A lot of maturing to do. Hello? Now, I thought I was polished. I thought I knew everything. I had read Brother Hagin's book. I knew how to preach it. I, kn I knew. I knowed what I knowed. Not much. Because if it's just up here, you don't really know it. Y'all here? Amen? So you, we grow. So I've, I've seen. I've been around. I've, I've uh, been with ministers and heard them talk about things. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Lester Summerall's. Now listen, folks, I'm not talking about being just in a meeting. I've sat at dinner with these men. Okay? I've sat in their presence and let them share. You don't say much when they're talking other than if you can ask a question. You don't try to interject. Well, I think you, know, you shut up. Let them talk. I've sat with Lester Summerall. I've sat with C.M. Ward. I've sat with... Um, Pastor Hagen. I've sat with all these, a lot of these different ministries. Dennis Burke's been in our church. I've had, you know, uh, our church in Greenville, we had so many different ministers come in. You know, I mean, name ministries. And we'd eat dinner with them. And they share with you. C.M. Ward, who uh, wrote the Pentecostal Evangel for the Assemblies of God, you're talking about a wealth of knowledge. 
sat there with us at the dinner table after, after a service. And he had been on TBN and, and, and told Paul Crouch, he said, Paul, the symbols of God must be on the pill. <laughs> Brother Paul looked at him and thought, well, Brother Ward, why would you say that? Huh, because I haven't given birth to anything in years. Yeah. <laughs> National TV. <laughs> we said, we said Brother Ward, what, what happened? He said, yeah, I got called in by Springfield. They sat me down and said, Brother Ward, we understand that you were on TV and said that the assemblies must be on the pill because they haven't given birth to anything for years. And he sat there for a second. And he said, ha, it's amazing what a man will say when he's under the anointing. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> He's like one of the founding, <clears throat> beginning. I mean, if they it communicated him, they lose half the church, half the churches, not just the church, half the churches. Tremendous respect. Hey, brother, someone will tell stories. Okay, uh, brother Ward told us. He said that when when um he was being ordained, they brought him in and sat him down in the middle. Of, he was in a prayer chair. And the presbytery was sitting in chairs around him. And they didn't say anything. They didn't ask any questions. They didn't say, why are you qualified for ministry or any of that stuff? And, you know, we have, your, we have the papers here saying this rec recommendation came and this recommendation came. And why should we ordain you? He said they looked at him and sat there and sat there. We said, what was going on, Brother Ward? He said, they were discerning me. He said they were listening in their spirit to see if the Holy Ghost had a recommendation. Because, see, we can fool men. Yeah. Are you here? You go home. But you can't fool the Holy Ghost. And they were waiting to see what the Spirit of God had to say about him sitting in there. Wow. They were discerning him. Oh, now it's, oh, we got this recommendation, this recommendation. Yeah, okay, he's, he's approved. Hello? <laughs> yeah. But he, apparently they discerned well because he got ordained. I don't know how we got so far over here tonight, but way over here. So I'm going to wrap it up. Follow the Spirit of God. Don't take big name, little name, somebody who thinks that they got they, and they, everything about the Spirit. You can't take their word for it or even their guidance. You're to be led by the Spirit. That's right. That's right. Now, there's wisdom in your in comfort and safety in your pastor. That's part of his anointing. Amen. I said that's part of his anointing. But if anybody stacks what they're doing up against your pastor as they have a higher whatever, you better run. Even if you didn't get a check. Amen. If God planted you, you follow the planting. Yeah. He knows how to tell you if, if pastor squirrely. Mm -hmm. If I come in next week and say Jesus is not the only way to the cross, you better all enough to get up and run. <clears throat> I mean, the only way of salvation. If I get up here and say, well, Muhammad is one of the ways, run. I expect you to get up and call heresy, Ichabod, and run out the door <laughs> and never come back again. You know? Or come lay hands on throw me down on the floor and cast the devil out. <laughs> Hello. It's truth. I said it's truth. The value of following the Spirit in everything is immeasurable. Now, I don't mean flaky. You don't have to walk around going, Ooh, I'm being led by the ooh, Spirit. Wee, ooh, ooh, wee. Hello? Or some diminished tone. I got doom, doom, doom. No, I'm spiritual. 
Follow the inward witness. Don't be pressured. If you're being pressured to do something different, don't follow that. That's not the Holy Ghost. He ain't going to force you. Brother, you need to get over here to this meeting. God's moving. Oh, so he's not moving in the church. Uh-huh. Now he's moving over here. Oh, yeah, he can move over there too. He can move right here three. Amen. See, sometimes there's insinuations there. Man, if you want to see a move of the Spirit, you got to be here. We brought it right here to you. God spoke. We had prophecy with the, about what was going to take place in the Spirit when Shekinah glory came. Brought right here in the house. Amen. Under the covering of the pastor by people who are covered by a pastor. Pastor Hagen is their pastor. They're members of Rama Bible Church. For 30 some years before that, they were members of, um, oh gosh, great Bible teacher. He used to teach at Rama. I can't think of his name right now. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll go home. Oh, yeah, so it's because he wrote the book on Galatians. You know, he has a book on Galatians and stuff. Great teacher. Great teacher. Okay? And, um, but they, they came and said, Pastor, he said, yeah, you need to go. You're supposed to be over at Ramah. He knew, he knew before they told him what was, God was dealing with about and went ahead and told them, you're supposed to go there. You're supposed to be a part of that. Now, as a pastor, been their pastor for 30 plus years. They come in, they want to talk to him, and they, and they keep, before they can even tell them what they're thinking, he's telling them, yeah, you're right. You're, you're, supposed, to go, you're supposed to go over to Ramah. You're supposed to be a part of that. It's God. And let them go. Wow. I'm sure you hate to lose them. They've seen, seen, seen. I mean, who wouldn't want to have Sacramento Glory as a guest minstrel every once in a while? Just show up on the church and do a Holy Ghost thing. Sing Band of Believers 45 times a year. <coughs> Hello? All right. I'm going to wrap it. This is me beginning to commence to start to edge towards wrapping up for the night. Let's see if we see the offering. If you get an offering envelope, see it back in front of you, watch it on TV or here in the house. Go ahead and get your electronic offerings ready. Praise God, PayPal or um, Cash App. Glory to God. Amen. Did y'all get anything out of any of that? I mean, anything? Hallelujah. So let me just give you this last word. If it ain't comfortable, don't do it. If you're doing something because you feel pressured to not hurt somebody's feelings, don't you do it. The wrong reason. I said, it's the wrong reason. I just can't make it. It's real simple. Why not? Well, I just, I can't. Okay. You know, they might go, well, hey, listen to the Holy Ghost. They, if they, the Holy Ghost, they would come and don't worry about what they say. It don't matter. You got to be comfortable in your spirit. And if you ain't, come talk to me. I might say, I don't have a clue. But I'm going to ask you questions. Why are you asking me? I'm not sure about it. There you go. That's all I need to hear. Then don't you do it. Amen. Father, we bless the people as they tithe and give and sow into the kingdom of God. Open up heaven's windows and pour out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, Brother Joe, receive that. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Remember these verses, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad.